applies this scripture with those definitions. His soul is not upright in him. So whenever you see your soul in scripture, that it also encompasses all these other things. Like, for example, your intellect. Amen? If your intellect is not upright, then you can't be just. Therefore, you also can't live by faith. And then you continue. If your will is not upright, if you're not, if you're not prioritizing the things of God as your motivation, then you can't be just and you can't live by faith. If your imagination, where your subconscious mind goes, where your subconscious mind goes, if it's not on the things of God, you can't be just, therefore you can't live by faith. So before we even get to the things that restrict our faith, we also need to know how can we accurately and properly exercise our faith? How can we live by faith? When it comes to your intellect, your intellect is the faculty of your soul that stores information governing your objective reasoning and understanding. That's your intellect. If you, if you're, what your knowledge base is made out of are things that do not align with the word of God, you cannot be just, therefore you'll find it difficult to start moving in faith. And different intellects that fall under that, guys, are things like, you know, the stars. You know, we, we hear all the, a lot of people speaking about astrology, thinking about stones and crystals, amen, thinking about um, all these different things that do not align with what the word of God says for us. Amen. Me, if I'm looking for peace, I won't go and grab the pink ruby or the green ruby. No, 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 no. I will not be anxious and commit my prayer unto God so that his peace can surround my thoughts. Am I talking to somebody? That's intellect. If, and the thing about it is, when it comes to your intellect, we all learn things, for example, in science, you know, evolution and stuff like that. But the thing about it is, what governs your reasoning and your understanding? If you understand that God created the universe, God created all things that came into being, Number one and number two, if you can understand that Jesus Christ rose from the dead for you and I, that everything in between, before and after, that has to do with the things of God, you can exercise your faith completely and wholly without doubt. Why? Because if God can create the universe, then why can't God, am I, am I talking to somebody, if God can create the universe, then why can't God cause a flood to roam across the earth? If God can create the universe, then why can't Jesus Christ die and rise again? If God can create the universe, then why can't he resurrect you from your situation and lift you up on high? Am I, am I talking to somebody? So this is what I'm speaking about when it comes to our faith and exercising our faith. If we have these kinds of intellects, if you claim to believe in God, but you also believe in something that doesn't align with the word of God, and that thing governs your intellect or your reasoning, you'll find it difficult to live by faith. First, we need to submit ourselves fully to that will of God in order for us to move and walk in faith and exercise the things of, 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 of the spirit as it pertains to our walk with God. Can I hear an amen? Oh, one more time. Can I hear a bigger amen? So let's go to John chapter 4, verse 24 really quickly. Um, people claim to be, you know, spiritual. Being spiritual doesn't equate to having faith. Scripture says, God is spirit, uppercase S. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So you hear all the time people saying things like, I'm spiritual, I just don't believe in God. It's an error. Why? Because what you believe in, you might be spiritual, but it's not true. So the only way you can worship God truly and holy, W-H, in, in its entirety is if you believe in God who is both spirit and truth. You can believe in spiritual things, psychic readings, and all these different things, but it's not truth. So therefore, your spirituality means nothing. In order for you to exercise your faith, you need to commit your life to the things of God that are spirit, uppercase S, and also true. When you mix spirit and truth together, then you get the ability to move in faith. Amen. Am I, am I talking to somebody? I, I, I'm praying this morning that we all receive that ability to move in faith and exercise our faith. Oh, am, I, am I talking to somebody? Receive that ability to move in faith. Oh, I, I thought this was living faith that was, I was preaching. Receive that ability to move in faith. 
or one more time, receive that ability to move with faith. So, spirit and truth, they both equal faith. Without truth, these spiritual intellects are faulty, causing the soul not to be upright, disqualifying you from being able to live by faith. Next, your will. Let's turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 34. Run through these scriptures. Um, your will. Your will is what motivates you. Amen. Luke 17, 34, it says, it says where a man stores up his treasure is where his heart is. And if we listen to Bishop Darren Conventions of Saints, he also, um, he was speaking about the blessing, and he touched on these, this chapter here. And essentially, when, as human beings, if we begin to store up these treasures in earthen, in, in the earth realm, our, if our heart is where our, our money is, or if the heart is where you know some of these physical things are, then you'll find that wind can blow and everything that where you store up that treasure, it will blow away. And then your heart too that's in the middle of that wind, that thing too will blow away. Amen. Amen. If I store up my treasure on this, on this, in, in the back room somewhere, all my, my treasures, and I leave my heart with the treasures. Because it's on earth, it has the ability to just be lost to the wind. Yeah. But if I store up my treasure in heaven and I put my heart to with that treasure in heaven, then there's no attack of the enemy that can wipe out my treasure. Why? Because there's nothing on this earth, or sorry, there's no man on this earth that can take from heaven where my treasures are and where my heart is. Yeah. Amen? So because my heart is secure, it's easy for me to move in faith. Uh, are we following? Yes. Next, our imagination. This is the last one I'll touch on. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll read verse 5. So your intellect, your intellect tends to drive your imagination or your subconscious mind. So this scripture says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. Bringing into thought, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the intellect, it will begin to steer your imagination to all these different things. But if it's not God who's governing our daily lives, the way we move, where we go, uh, what we yearn for that day, then we can't be living in faith. We're, we're living by sight. And that's the Bible tells us specifically, don't move by sight, don't walk by sight, walk by faith. Amen. The moment your imagination starts to steer your, in, your intellect, you know, your will, your motivation, outside of the things of God, you can't live by faith. You can't live by faith. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now let's turn to James chapter 1, we'll read from verse 5 to verse 8. So, that scripture, bringing into captivity every, every high thing that exalts itself against Christ, that's how we actively defend our faith. Every, not all these knowledges, all these different types of knowledge, don't allow them to subvert the faith that you have in God. Amen. Let your faith be strong. I say it all the time. Let your faith be ironclad. Amen. Let your faith be bulletproof. Amen. Let your faith be powerful. So that no attack of the enemy can prosper concerning your faith. Am I talking to somebody? So the scripture here, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. That's what the scripture says. Ask of God, and if you ask of God, it will be given unto you liberally and without reproach. But then the verse 6 also says, But let him, everybody say but. Wow. The scripture says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let's go to verse 8. And for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. The man who is doubting, asking God in doubt. Don't even think that God will supply a need. Why? Because you're not moving fully in faith. You're encompassing doubt into your faith. There's, you can't obligate God or, the, or heaven to work on your behalf when you don't even believe that heaven can fulfill that mission. You want to obligate them to complete. You want heaven to operate or to work on your behalf, then have faith that heaven can do it. 
the moment you begin to mix down with your faith, you become like a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Unstable. Unstable. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be unstable. Move in faith. Turn to the other side and say, don't be unstable. Look, move in faith. Faith, imagine faith like a bottle of water and doubt or fear or anxiety is like, is like poison you put in the water. Even if you fill the water to 90% and you have 10% poison, don't expect to live after you drink the water. Same thing with, with prayer or committing certain things into the hands of God. Don't, don't ask or pray with doubt and fear driving your prayer or with fear and anxiety driving your prayer. When you pray, pray with confidence and with faith that your God in heaven who created the universe has the power to deliver you from your issues. Oh, am I talking to somebody? The God who created the heaven and the earth. If he can do, if he can suspend the earth in, in, in space, how much more can he suspend you? How much more can he keep you in your life? How much more can he keep you safe? How much more can he protect your children and your loved ones? If God has that power, what makes you think that he can't also enact that power on your behalf? Hallelujah. And I'm praying this morning that we'll all see a move of the power of God in our lives. Oh, my, I feel like I'm not a little bit. I feel like I'm in the middle of Oh, let me feel like I'm in the middle of I pray that God will feel the power of God move in your life. That every crooked path will become straight. That every evil thing will be corrected. All for his glory. Can I hear an amen? Oh, one more time. Let me hear a bigger amen. Amen. God wants you to have faith so rich that there's no room for doubt. Now, hear me. What I'm saying it might sound problematic at first, but hear me and hear me, child. This is Bishop will say, hear me, child of God. Hear me, child of God. It's better to have a little bit of faith or to exercise a little bit of faith than to overstretch and, and exercise too much faith and then you mix that faith with doubt. Right. It's an error. It's better for you to exercise a little bit of faith Amen. than to try and exercise faith outside of your capacity and then begin driving that prayer with doubt and with fear and with anxiety. And I'll prove it to you with scripture. Can I hear an amen? amen. Oh, I'm not. Can I hear an amen? amen? Turn to Mark chapter 4. We'll read from verse 35 to verse 41. So when you say these things, Everything needs to be back with the word of God. So what I'm doing right now is I'm braiding. I'm taking different scriptures and I'm putting them together, braiding. So Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And then 36 says, Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And the great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. The boat was filling with water. Then in verse 38 it says, But he, the he that's speaking about is Jesus. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow while the ship is sinking. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The manner in which the disciples approached Jesus Christ wasn't with faith or with confidence. It was with fear for their lives. Hear me. Jesus Christ called the disciples. So to him, he understands that because you've accepted me as your God, then you have faith that if, if I'm on this boat, none of us are going to die. Amen. If me, the Son of God, is, is on this boat, I can rest the shore. You two can rest the shore. Because if I'm not going to die, you think I'll let you who follow me also die in this boat. So imagine us when we approach God with this kind of this kind of attitude. You can even say pride. Yeah. Teacher, do you not care that we're gonna perish? What? You're saying that to you think Jesus' assignment is ending on that boat? <laughs> but that's what fear and anxiety does. It blinds you yeah. Yeah. from the saving power of your God. Yeah. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody? Yeah. So 
all the time. These may be stories and scriptures that we're familiar with. Yeah. You know, Jesus in the boat. But really ask God for understanding. Because yeah. even the most simple David and Goliath has levels and levels and levels of revelation and impact and life-changing power. Can I hear amen? Yeah. So now verse 39 says that he arose and rebuked the wind. This is, or go back to verse 38. I want to read it all together. So let's read verse 38. One go. But he was in the stern asleep on the pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teach it. Do you not care? Like, you don't care that we're all about to die? Then in verse 39 it says, let's all read it. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Then go to verse 40. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? No fear. You're following me and you have no faith. Believers, disciples, future patriarchs of the church. Jesus Christ is looking at them like, you're, you're following me with no faith. Right, Mrs. Suzette? You're following me with no faith. How can you follow me, follow me with absolutely no faith? Why? They allowed their fear to poison the faith that they had. So in Matthew, in Matthew, when you look at this scripture, what it speaks about is, the specific term is, how is it that you have little faith? Here it says, how is it that you have no faith? So what I'm telling you is that it's better for you to have little faith without fear than to try and exercise faith too mighty for you outside of your capacity and then begin going to God in fear and in doubt. Now, hear me and continue to hear me. Let's turn to Luke chapter 17. We'll read from verse 5 to verse 6. Just have a few scriptures. So anxiety and fear, these are your faith constrictors. These are your faith, these are the things that restrict your faith or your ability to move in faith. So here, and the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord responded to the apostles and said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, a little bit of faith. You can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will do what? Obey you. This is a little bit of faith. A mustard seed. It's better for you to have that little bit of faith and see the power with a little bit of faith. Absent from fear, doubt, and anxiety. The potential that your little bit of faith has, even in the earth realm, that you can say to a mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be placed in the sea, just doing things that make no sense, but exercising faith without fear and doubt. There's no limit that can restrict you. Why? Because the things that are restricting you, faith, fear, doubt, anxiety, they're gone. They're absent. They're invisible. They don't, they don't, they can't influence the faith that you have. These are the d dynamics of faith that we need to hold close to us. Yeah. Not allowing doubt and fear. Exercise the little bit of faith. Yeah. And see the, the lot of bit of things that God can do for you. Am I talking to somebody? Oh, am I talking to somebody? Yeah. 